Good evening. Good evening, I'm Mike Garrett. I'm the Institute's Associate Director for Development and Public Affairs. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk, which is sponsored by the Einstein Legacy Society. It's the group that recognizes those who, like Albert Einstein and many others, have included the Institute in their estate plans. We trust that the panel we've put together for tonight to discuss asset allocation strategies for the new decade will be inspirational as well as informative. We know there are many aspects to managing our resources, adjusting our portfolios for risk and return as we age, exercising discipline in our spending to make sure our resources last, and hopefully adding to our wealth by accumulating capital. This is the focus of the development office's work at the Institute, accumulating capital through gifts to build up the Institute's endowment and to ensure its financial future. We all read about major gifts made by those listed among the world's wealthiest citizens, and the Institute is very fortunate to have benefited from this kind of philanthropy. But it's very important to add that the Institute also has benefited enormously from the generosity of friends, faculty, and members who have made planned gifts of all sizes. Indeed, most of us here today with careful planning and expert advice are capable of building up the institutions we care about, while in many cases also providing income and tax benefits for ourselves and for those we love. I urge you to listen to our speakers today and to think about becoming a member of the Einstein Legacy Society. Katie Newcomb is our development officer in charge of plan giving, and she's happy to answer questions about bequests, gifts of real estate, and other arrangements that offer lifetime income to the donors. Uh, Katie is standing over here, and I'm sure uh, that she'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. I'd also like to thank the co-chairs of the Einstein Legacy Society who are with us tonight. Uh, Marty Chuljan, who's seated there, and Rosanna and Charlie Jaffin, who are seated there in the back of the room. The three of them have done a great deal for the Institute through their personal generosity and their leadership of this program, and we're very grateful to them. Now I'd like to introduce you to our panel of speakers led by Marty Leibowitz. Marty is Managing Director in Morgan Stanley's U.S. Research Department. He is the co-author of the newly published book, The Endowment Model of Investing, Return, Risk, and Diversification. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Marty was Vice Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of TIAA CREF from 1995 to 2004 with the responsibility uh, for the management of over $300 billion in equity, fixed income, and real estate assets. Previously, he had a 26-year association with Solomon Brothers where he became Director of Global Research covering uh, both fixed income and equities and was a member of Solomon's Executive Committee. Marty received both AB and MS degrees from the University of Chicago and a PhD in mathematics from the Courant Institute of New York University. Marty's a trustee of the Institute for Advanced Study and serves as vice chairman of the board of trustees as well as president of the corporation. Bob Litterman. Uh, Bob Litterman is the retired chairman of Quantitative Investment Strategies Group of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Bob is the co-developer, along with the late Fisher Black, of the Black-Litterman Global Asset Allocation Model, a key tool in the Investment Management Division's asset allocation process. He also served as head of Goldman's research, of Goldman's uh, firm-wide firm -wide risk department and co-director of the Fixed Income Division's research department. Before joining Goldman Sachs in 1986, Bob was an assistant vice president in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and an assistant professor of the, in the economics department at MIT, where I believe that he was a colleague of Eric Maskin. He earned a BS in human biology from Stanford University and a PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota. Lonnie Steffens founded Spring Mountain Capital in 2001. Previous to that, he spent 38 years at Merrill Lynch & Company, where he held numerous senior management positions. These included 
president of Merrill Lynch's private client group from 1985 until 1997, vice chairman of Merrill Lynch and Company Incorporated, and chairman of its U.S. private client group from 1997 until 2001. Under his leadership of the private client group, client assets at Merrill Lynch rose from $189 billion to approximately $1.6 trillion. Lonnie was elected a member of the board of directors of Merrill Lynch and Company in 1986 and served on the board until 2001. He graduated from Dartmouth College with a bachelor's degree in economics and attended the advanced management program of the Harvard Business School. Uh, please help me welcome our speakers and Marty. Th thank you all. You could probably gather from uh, Mike's uh, uh, elongated biographies that um, my involvement has been primarily with institutions. Um, Bob has had a broader range of uh, involvement, and uh, Lonnie has uh, had a, a very, very deep experience with uh, uh, individual and retail accounts. Uh, so we'll try to um, provide information which is useful uh, to you coming from the various sources. But I'm going to speak briefly, and I'll do something which um, no author should ever do. I'm going to tell you in a very few words what the key idea is in the book that was just published called The Endowment Model. Uh, the idea was something which is, is um, it's in your, your handout, but basic idea was an observation that just about every, every portfolio, certainly every institutional portfolio, has risk which is dominated by movements in equity. The short-term risk, the short-term volatility is totally dominated by whatever happens in the equity market. That was point number one. Point number two was that in normal times, that volatility is roughly the same as that of a traditional 60-40 fund, 60% equity, 40% fixed income. That's kind of remarkable because <clears throat> institutional funds, as um, many of you know, have gone to a very diversified model where they sometimes hold as little as 10% fixed income, um, maybe as little as 20% U.S. equity, and the rest being international equity, real estate, um, high-yield debt of various sorts, emerging market debt, uh, commodities, timber, all kinds of stuff. So to find that this complex, diversified portfolio still has the same short-term volatility uh, as <clears throat> as a traditional 60-40 fund was very shocking to them. Now, you can't write an entire book about that. There are a lot of other, well, you can't actually. People do that sort of thing all the time. But there are a lot of other implications that follow from it. But that's the key idea. The one other thing that towards the end of uh, uh, 2007 was that once we knew this, it occurred to us that if you put this together with something else that's very, very common knowledge in the investment field, uh, that namely in very bad times, correlations between different asset classes get worse and worse and worse, go towards one. It follows that institutions who, if they basically are pari pursue in terms of volatility risk during normal times, that in bad times, they will find themselves actually doing worse than a traditional fund. And indeed, that happened in 2008. Uh, it was compounded by liquidity problems but many of the more sophisticated, more advanced institutions, not the Institute for Advanced Studies, I might add, but <clears throat> other less sophisticated institutions like um, some of the Ivy League colleges, et cetera, uh, did very, very badly. And we're very shocked to find out how much uh, uh, their liquidity uh, was drained and became a problem. Uh, this was, in retrospect, predictable. And the book talks a little bit about that as well raises the question, well, why diversify? Why go to these, quote, sophisticated models? And the answer to that is very simple. If you looked at the returns for 15 years prior to 2008, the returns were extraordinary, far better than a simple 60-40 fund. There is a great payoff to these diversification efforts, as done, I should quickly say, as done by the more sophisticated, larger funds. They did very, very well. Uh, the question is to what happens now, where they go forward, how do they view this prospect of better long-term return at the price of what may be increased short-term volatility in bad times remains to be seen. But for the most part, and we can talk more about this if you like later on, 
they seem to have stuck with their basic model uh, and are making um, some adjustments around the edges. But no one that I know is totally abandoning in the institutional world the idea of a diversified fund. So with that, let me just quickly turn it over to Bob. Uh, well, thank you very much, Marty. Uh, by the way, let me just say, we're, we're trying to get through this introductory comments as quickly as possible, So, because we want to be responsive to questions that you may have. Um, and so we're all prepared to try to at least address as best we can. So think of what you'd like to ask, ask Bob or Lonnie. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, very brief. I, I think um, Marty probably invited me to uh, speak here because, uh, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, about two decades ago, I was uh, uh, happened to be uh, lucky enough to be working with Fisher Black, who many of you may know. He's very well known um, for the Black-Scholes formula. And um, he was at Goldman Sachs. And I was asked to build an asset allocation model. And uh, so I went to Fisher and I said, Fisher, there's, I've been doing a little bit of reading of the literature. There's a lot of different models. What do you suggest? And he said, well, Bob, there's, there, there are a lot of models out there. I, I think you should try the simplest model first. And if that doesn't work, then you can try something more sophisticated. And the simplest model was uh, what's called the mean variance optimization. It uh, tries to trade off risk and return. And... Uh, uh, basically, we, we assume investors would like to have the highest possible return for a given level of risk. And so you put in a bunch of assumptions about expected returns, a bunch of assumptions about risk and volatilities and correlations, and you let the optimizer run. And so I did that, and uh, I found that uh, it was incredibly badly behaved. There's a lot of subtleties in those assumptions about expected returns and volatilities and correlations. and. Uh, with a little bit of benefit of hindsight, I would say what the optimizer does is it looks for the uh, inconsistencies among your assumptions and tries to take advantage of them. And uh, so I, I uh, uh, actually, I thought I'd probably made a, a programming error because it was so badly behaved. But after I convinced myself, no, that's really what it does, I went back to Fisher. Fisher was a genius. Um, and I said, Fisher, uh, this thing is incredibly badly behaved. And he says, well, Bob, you know, that's well known. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, well, what do we do about that? And he said, uh, well, you know, maybe we should build an equilibrium model into this. And, uh, and that sounded to me like an incredibly uh, academic idea, you know, that the idea that the world is in equilibrium. But it, it turns out uh, what Fisher had in mind is something uh, many of you may know. It, it's sometimes called the CAPM. It's, an, it's a general equilibrium model. And um, it, it is a, uh, I won't go into the details about it, but it, it recognizes one of the things that Marty pointed out, that basically equity risk is the dominant risk out there. Uh, it's what economists call this a, a systematic risk. It's a risk that someone has to take. And, uh, and so the, the, result, the, the basic result from the capital asset pricing model is that there is a expected return that every asset should be uh, ju is justified having. It's, it's a uh, return proportional to what's called the beta of an asset. It's covariance with the uh, basically the equity market, the market portfolio, which is dominated by equity risk. And, uh, and that model has some very uh, nice uh, implications, and particularly when we think about what are some of the lessons from the last couple of years. Wh what can we learn? Uh, one of the uh, issues that comes up is, you know, what do you do if there is a market crash? You know, we had this uh, basically a 50% drop in equities, and uh, I know a lot of institutions uh, were really struggling with that. Most institutions had a policy of rebalancing portfolios, and uh, as the market goes down, so they have a strategic benchmark, uh, let's say it's 60-40, uh, as the market equity market goes down, uh, they become underweight equities because their bond portfolio is not as affected. So if they were 60-40, they become, you know, maybe 50-50 or something like that. And uh, the traditional approach is to uh, rebalance back to benchmark. But, of course, if you did that while the market was going down, every time you got below, you bought equities, it became very painful. And I would say by the time we got to the spring of uh, 2009, uh, there were very few institutions that were continuing to rebalance. People had gotten very scared. I don't know, maybe you had a different experience, but my experience was people, many had just given up on rebalancing. 
And, uh, and so I, I was out there saying, well, you know, you ought to rebalance. One of my colleagues said, Bob, you know, you can't all rebalance in equilibrium. He said, you know, if someone's buying stocks, someone's got to be selling. So uh, there's some reason why you're saying people should be rebalancing. I said, well, I, you know, if, if, if you thought you ought to have this much risk and now you don't have that much risk. But uh, I was wrong. It's, it's not that simple. Um, so the answer is, uh, who should be buying stocks and who should be selling at the bottom of the market? Well, if, if everyone's the same in equilibrium, no one should be doing anything. That's one of the implications of the capital asset pricing model. Everyone just holds that portfolio. Uh, but in, in a world where some people have longer investment horizons and some people have shorter investment horizons, the answer is those who have longer investment horizons should be buying equities when markets are down because they have the ability to take advantage of this uh, uh, basically uh, long-term um, uh, phenomena that equities tend to get overvalued and undervalued. They tend to have more uh, mean reversion than, uh, uh, than theory would suggest. And if you have the stomach for it, that's a great time to be uh, buying equities. On the other hand, when they're overvalued, you should be selling equities. And uh, that kind of uh, counter-cyclical uh, policy is something that uh, uh, I think comes out of that uh, understanding of the difference between being a long-term and a shorter-term investor. The other, I think, uh, interesting implication from the uh, capital asset pricing model and the recent uh, experience that we had is, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, farther uh, field, and that is I think it has an implication for uh, climate change. You know, if you think about what happened in uh, the uh, economic downturn, it was basically a consequence of mispricing risk. The uh, risk in mortgages was consciously mispriced, I would say, by the government. And, uh, and then if you think about the Gulf disaster, same thing, mispricing of risk. Uh, the, the capital asset pricing model tells you Every risk should be priced at some amount. And when you misprice risk, people will take too much risk or too little risk. Right now, uh, and, and by the way, there's a question of discounting. How do you discount these risks? And they're not all discounted at the same rate. If it's a systemic risk, it's a risk that is, should be priced. And I would say climate change is a systemic risk. A systemic risk is not something necessarily correlated with equities. It's something that you can't escape from, a society can't escape from climate change. And so many economists don't understand this, but you shouldn't discount the uh, uh, efforts to uh, price uh, the damages created by carbon emissions because they're a systemic risk. And, um, and when we misprice them, and right now we're not charging for greenhouse gas emissions, we're gonna create too much of that risk and uh, this is something that uh, I'm an optimist. I think this problem can be solved, but the only way it's going to be solved is if we price risk appropriately in this case. And right now we're horribly mispricing that risk. So I think that's another implication of that theory. And thank you. I'll turn it <laughs> over to Lonnie. <laughs> On that cherry note, um, if you take out the little blue books that are in front of you, I'm going to make you all work a little bit uh, in terms of some of the things I'm going to say. And hopefully it brings it down to uh, – uh, uh, how individuals can look at this from a practical standpoint. Uh, I think that uh, what we're going to try to do uh, is convince you that uh, uh, that asset allocation uh, maybe in the past uh, was an option today. I think it's a necessity. Uh, and I think that as Marty has discussed, it's been used very effectively in lots of institutional models for uh, 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 quite some time. But the question is, how do individuals basically put this into uh, practice, and, and what are the issues? The issues, I think, as Bob just said, are very simple. Uh, the fact is, is that individual investors are actually quite manic about their portfolios. Uh, and so if you look at the uh, highs in 07, nobody wanted to necessarily get off of that train. Uh, and just 18 months later, uh, all of us were standing on the precipice in the spring of 09, uh, wondering whether the world was coming to an end and, and what, in fact, we could be doing about it. Uh, and so we weren't likely to be all of that positive. 
I think that unfortunately the psychological aspects of this are very hard to uh, basically forget, uh, and it's very hard to be that disciplined to do the right things about buying low, so to speak, and, and selling high. The complexities, I think, uh, of small changes in broad asset class kinds of portfolios is oftentimes very difficult for individual investors at the same time. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing today is that investment cycles are getting to be shorter and shorter and shorter, uh, and volatility is becoming sort of the accepted norm, uh, and it makes rational decision making even more difficult. If you go to page three, uh, the thing that I think is interesting is I would make the argument that the world is getting more and more complicated uh, every day. If we look at the late 80s and early 90s, uh, we can look back and think that that was a complicated period, but we got through the SNL crisis, eight or 900 banks failed, uh, and it didn't have any really long-term lasting problem. Uh, we had the first Gulf War, again, not a big problem. And what I find fascinating is there were more books written on the fact that Japan was heralded as a solution to the economic system in the late 80s and early 90s than almost uh, any other economic book around, and we've seen how well that worked. In the late 90s, we began to see uh, uh, sort of the tech boom ending. It really didn't end. It was really a valuation problem. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing more technology today, whether it's iPhones and iPods and iPads and, and all the like, uh, than was ever the case. But that valuation created some significant issues, along with a couple of guys that basically cooked the books uh, and made it somewhat difficult. We also experienced uh, something that has been uh, really quite unfortunate, but it was the first geopolitical risk that really had a, a, a major implication for us, and it was 9-11. And then, all during that same period of time, credit was viewed by people as, uh, as being free, and so we got to that kind of an issue fairly quickly. If you look at the list, however, for the current period, uh, and I suspect if we went around the room, we could make the list a lot longer, uh, many of these things are known because you read about them in the paper every day or you see them on the news. The thing that isn't known particularly well is what's going to be the outcome. So the outcome of some of these kinds of issues, I think, adds to the risk elements and to the, the uncertainty. I'm not going to cover every one of these or we'll be here till midnight, uh, but I think it's interesting if you think about this in sort of simple terms. Greece was a place that used to go for vacation and you go to drink uh, a little wine and, uh, and sit in the sun, and now it's viewed as the cornerstone of whether or not Europe is going to enter a, a very interesting credit problem that likely to have significant contagion to the United States. So, you, so here's a little country, uh, less than half of the, the size of economically most of the states in the United States, uh, that's likely to have a, a, a fairly large implication. I think what's happened lately probably stabilizes Greece for six months to a year, uh, but it's not a given that it's going to get stabilized for forever. The next, uh, the next slide on, on page four is probably the scariest one around because uh, it looks at what's the U.S. deficit. And my sense is, is that uh, uh, this is a very unsustainable track uh, that's going to take very significant kinds of, of, uh, uh, of things that we're gonna, are going to have to be done to basically change this curve. And if we don't do it, uh, it's likely to make Greece look uh, a fairly, a fairly uh, uh, simple. So what are the solutions to all of this? Uh, there are three possibilities. We can hide under the covers. Uh, we can use uh, better living through chemistry and take the best antidepressant that's around today, uh, or, or we can go to cash. Uh, my attitude is none of those are very either practical or realistic approaches. And so what is going to be the solution to some of the things that we've just talked about? And, and I think that it's based on portfolio construction. Uh, and so, for example, uh, I unfortunately have been in the investment business now for some 44 or 45 years, and for the first 40 of them, I don't think I ever told anybody to buy gold. Uh, and I think very differently today. I think every portfolio ought to have a little. Uh, 
uh, by a little 5%, maybe 7%, to take care of all of some of these things that uh, could have a, a, a flight to uh, – uh, uh, a flight to uh, safety, uh, inflation issues, et cetera. Since 19, uh, since 2000, uh, gold's up 281 percent, Treasury's up 100, and the stock market's down eight. So it gives you at least some flavor that thinking about these things before they happen uh, and plugging them into the portfolio make great sense. I thought this chart in here on on page five was kind of fun. It goes back to 1267. Uh, that's not December of 67, but it goes back to 1267. Uh, and uh, I guess the reason that this chart's around is that the British pound, you know, I guess, is the only currency that's been around that long. But this basically says that gold on an adjusted basis is basically been a pretty good protector uh, in terms uh, of value. If you look at the next page, it also says that uh, in terms of its ratio to the S&P, the S&P on a long-term basis, it's uh, about 1.5 uh, times. It's currently at 1.1. And during unusual periods in the last 70 or 80 years, it's been as high as four or five times. So gold doesn't look particularly expensive, at least in terms of, uh, of, of these two uh, particular issues. Now, one of the things that I think uh, certainly Bob has said and, and institutions have looked at for a long time there, there's a consistent rotation of asset classes. And they go from the bottom of the list to the top of the list uh, on, a, on a regular uh, kind of a, a systematic approach. Uh, but the key is to how to get some of those changes right. You don't have to get all of them right, but you have to get a couple of them right in terms of thinking about it. And so if you think about a tactical asset allocation approach to your portfolio, this isn't about diversification, because diversification, you could argue, is if I own 20 stocks, I have a diversified portfolio. But this is going to be a diversification across asset classes, across risk, and across correlations. And I think that, ultimately, it makes good sense. So if you take a look, one of the things I found interesting is over the last 20 years, the number one asset class was emerging market debt, earned 15.5% for 20 years compounded. And so uh, if we were sitting here 20 years ago, I doubt that many people would have raised their hand and said, I'm going to go after that emerging market debt. looks like a great idea. Uh, and so uh, I think that, that some of those kinds of issues uh, are actually quite important. Uh, on the next page, I've tried to show a couple of simple, simple examples that if you took a static allocation of 40 percent bonds, 10% uh, gold and 50% equities, and you looked at some of these simple kinds of outlines, and so if we said, gee, in an inflation environment, that portfolio over the next three years probably does about 5%. If we muddle through and equities are, are somewhat better, uh, we probably get a 15% rate of return. And so even in this simple example, it's important to understand the context in which you're trying to create the portfolios. So I think that it's important to think it through in terms of how you decide to position it. And if we change some of those on a tactical basis, maybe the returns would have been dramatically, uh, dramatically better. I think one of the things that we're probably also underinvested in is emerging markets. And I think that the emerging market story is one that's going to be with us for the next 25 years or more. Uh, and if you look at the basic numbers, I think it's interesting. Something like 80% of the world's population is in, emerg in emerging markets defined by the MSCI index. Uh, they are 45% of the world's GDP currently. Uh, they are growing four to five times faster than the developed world. And uh, I think that uh, even with the volatility that's associated with those, plus some of the concerns about rule of law, et cetera, in, in the aggregate, uh, they are clearly going to be a place that that is probably a, a got a place in in pretty much everybody's portfolio. On page ten, I've listed countries from uh, their net debt position to uh, their GDP ratios, uh, and it's sort of interesting to see where some of these uh, countries lie and and what's likely to happen. Uh, the bottom 10 or 12 on this list are all in surplus. Uh, and so whether it's Singapore, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Taiwan, 
China from the bottom, I would argue that those places over the next decade are very likely to have stronger currencies, stronger debt markets, and probably stronger equity markets uh, than, the P than the people on the top five or ten uh, in terms of the list. If we look at all of these discussions that we've had this, this evening, there's one that, in my opinion, is uh, pretty much undefinable or undeniable, and that is I can make one prediction that I think will stand the test. Uh, there's one thing that I think will go up in the next three years, and uh, whether there's anything we can do about it or not, this is not a tactical allocation aspect, but it's taxes. So the, the fact is, is that we're going to see significant tax increases over the next period of time, and it has very important application to your portfolio starting in 2010. Uh, the, uh, the tax on capital gains is going to go up 66 percent, and the tax on dividends is going to go up uh, 140 percent. And so as you think about portfolio shifts, uh, sometime between now and December the 31st may have some very important implications on how you look at different asset classes. So, for example, one sort of simple outcome of that, municipals are going to have a dramatically improved uh, sort of relationship to the total because they're going to be much more tax favored than they have for the last several years. So the, the tax aspects of this, I think, are going to become even more important. So having identified uh, all the worldwide implications of the appropriate allocations uh, and solving for tax problems, there is one conclusion that hopefully you will take away, maybe from everything that all three of us have said. Uh, I'm afraid that we're going to have to live with volatility and uncertainty for, for the foreseeable future. And I think that what that's going to mean is how you decide to put risk considerations into your portfolio. So with that, I guess we'll go to Q&A. Yeah. So um, uh, <clears throat> questions from the floor? And let me – I'll start off by asking one. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we, we had a prior little talk among ourselves before, and um, uh, Lonnie said that uh, he felt that uh, – fewer than 10 percent of the audience would probably own any gold. And I just wonder if that's true. So could we have a show of hands? Other than wristwatches and jewelry, <laughs> uh, how many people own gold as an investment? Yeah, interesting. About 10. About 10 percent. Yeah. Very good. Oh. Well, that's a – hey, Lonnie, your, your record's intact. <laughs> um, now, I'll, I'll make a bet that a very high percentage owns municipal bonds. Right? And let's see what the munis is. Hmm. It's lower than I would thought. Lower than I, lower than I, well, I mean, people are, you know, people are, uh, I mean, people own assets <coughs> in, in Swiss bank accounts. <laughs> 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 there could be a selection issue here. <laughs> well, Lonnie, you are, um, are quite an expert in, in munis. Could you, and, you know, you, you alluded to the fact that they will, um, Improving their in their in their tax status on a relative basis, uh, going through um, the, the tax increases that we're sure to face, and I think hard to disagree with that. Um, but there's also been a lot of talk as to some of the strains that the uh, governmental entities that are issuing munis are going through, and th so how does that play into your, you know how people should think about their muni portfolio? Look, I, I agree with that. I, I think that uh, clearly. Uh, there, again, there's lots of front page news about New York and California, New Jersey, et cetera, uh, and, and states that are having great degrees of difficulty. I think we haven't seen that come to fruition yet. It used to be pretty simple. You buy a, a decent quality municipal bond, you put it away, and it did pretty well. The default rate of municipals was teeny. Uh, I think that's going to change, and uh, I think we're going to see more defaults. Uh, in, in the next 10 years, and so I think you have to work on, on selecting muni portfolios to some extent better than have been done in the past. Um, I think that essential services muni, so electric and gas and airports and some of those kinds of things in, in growing markets are probably going to be better than ones that would, uh, you know, be uh, tied to uh, 
let's say, revenue of, uh, of different kinds of things that don't have the same qualification. So I, I think it's going to be tougher to manage muni portfolios in the next decade over the last. Okay. Um, any questions uh, yet? Um, okay, from the back. Yes, please. It does, although that understates it, because um, it, in getting those historical numbers that you see in the first chart there, we had to um, uh, we, we had to get basically reasonable indices that were well priced and priced with some frequency. So we basically uh, substituted things like REITs for real estate. Uh, we didn't have private equity. So we created a portfolio that was diversified, but it's not the diversified portfolio uh, that many of the um, larger endowments and um, uh, really had. They had a lot more private assets, which, again, if you looked at the actual performance of them, did very much, much better than this. Um, as much as I th my recollection, we have, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, the returns are in the book, but um, I think that the, it was really uh, extraordinary. It was like uh, 4 to 5 percent per year over a 15-year period. It was very, very good performance. And that was one of the reasons why um, many institutions really didn't worry. They, they have a spending requirement, which is typically in the 4 to 5% range, uh, or sometimes a bit higher. But they never worried about it, because it was, the returns were so ample that they felt it could go on forever. Um, and I think that, uh, that what, a couple of things have changed. I mentioned that basically I didn't think their overall attitude towards asset allocation had changed much. But some things have. One thing ha that has changed is they realize that trying to be able to get 4 or 5% on a real basis, on a continuing basis after inflation, is indeed a challenge. And uh, that's being um, uh, thought about in terms of implications not just for the portfolio, but for the spending and capital plans of many institutions. The other thing that's changed is there's a lot more attention to liquidity. And uh, it, that's both as a result of uh, what transpired, and I think uh, a, a realization that the liquidity problems and issues potentially, you know, especially in a, any kind of bad market, will be with us for a long, long time. Um, uh, oh, second question for Bob and Lonnie. Okay, go ahead. Go get him. Frank Knight. <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> You're the economist. Yeah. Well, I, I would say the uh, the way I think about uncertainty is the uh, the possibility of bad outcomes, and so people typically think about risk in, in this Knightian uh, distinction as being something that you can measure or quantify. And, uh, and, and something like the capital asset pricing model, we typically use volatility as a measure of risk. And for, uh, you know, uh, liquid assets in normal times, that's a, a good first order approximation. But, um, but it's not uh, by any means a full uh, uh, measure of the possibility of uncertain outcomes. And as I mentioned, uh, when we think about something like climate change, uh, there is uncertainty and there is risk there and there's no volatility that I would we think we can think of uh, and so uh, I think you have to think but you, you know we use beta which is a statistical measure to measure the uh, uh, premium that a risky asset should provide but that's not adequate the real issue is in bad states of nature how much is uh, additional wealth going to be worth and, uh, and beta only measures a covariance with the uh, market. It's not the fundamental. The fundamental issue is what is going to be useful to you in a bad state of nature. I, I would say that, that uncertainty uh, is, are issues that risk is very difficult to assess. Uh, and that uh, uh, in many instances, if I take a look uh, at uh, the spring of 07, for example, uh, 
nobody seemed to care about risk. Uh, volatility in the equity markets was extremely low. Spreads of, of high yield debt to, to a government debt was at sort of an almost at an all time low. And and so oftentimes when you see those risk parameters at unusually low points, it's usually a sign for uh, some degree of concern. I, I, if I could just underline that, I remember in that period, uh, we had debates about this low volatility. It didn't, it just felt uh, very uh, uh, scary in a way. And uh, at that time, I was uh, sitting on Goldman's risk committee, and I asked one of our senior traders, uh, you know, what do you think about this low volatility? Because there were some people who said, you know, this reflects the new great moderation, the Fed has uh, solved the business cycle and all that. He said, you know, Bob, it's like uh, a beach ball being held underwater. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that was a very graphic uh, visual for me. And indeed, it turned out to be very prescient. But one thing we do know about volatility is it goes through cycles. It, it has many times become low and it doesn't stay there, and it gets very high. Although it's not, it's, it's, it's easy to say, and it's not always easy to know when it's gonna change. You know, the, the unusual thing about this event, uh, the last two years, is that uh, usually volatility spikes and then it slowly comes down. And in this event, uh, it really just kept going up and then it would come down a little bit and it went up to a new level, and then that happened three or four times. And it was really uh, very unusual in terms of the length of time that volatility kept building. And this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem, these problems kept spilling over from one area to the next to the next. Uh, they really started in 2006 with subprime mortgages. And yet the stock market peaked in, what, October of 2008, mm -hmm. 2007, yeah. So uh, it, it took a while for people to realize what was really happening. Uh, there's, there's a question. There's a question back there. I have uh, to jeopardize your time here. I have three questions, actually, but I'll try to make these simple. Why don't we start with one? I'll tell you something about timber. Um, one of the, um, again, talking institutionally, Harvard was one of the um, uh, early institutional investors in timber, and they went about it in a way which is actually very difficult for most entities to do. Uh, they actually hired a small staff of very good people. Uh, they developed a deep analysis where they thought that they could take advantage of a different way of buying timber, a different way of cutting timber, and a different way of deciding when to sell timber. And that had worked out, has worked out for them very, very well. But the, the key point that goes beyond timber is that what they did was to recognize that there are times when if you approach things in a special way and have good access, you can get what is a very promising structural long-term return. And at times, what may happen is that this asset class, which may not have been very popular, and, in, and as I said, timber was not institutionally popular before, it becomes fashionable. And as it becomes fashionable, and as people buy into it, the pricing changes. The price goes up. And when the price goes up, the return looks good. Okay, what's happening at the same time, if you have a model where you're modeling long-term returns, like with a bond, is you find that when the price goes up, the forward, going, the forward go, ongoing yield goes down, the return goes down. So at a certain point, they decided they were going to unload a fair amount of their at least U.S.-based timber. They didn't get out of the entire asset class, but they run essentially out to a large extent out of the U.S.-based timber. Yeah, but, you know, um, I think one has to recognize that these types of movements, and I think every, all the speakers have alluded to it in different ways, any asset class can get, it's not what is the intrinsic potential for return. It's not just what is the growth in a particular emerging market or 
Uh, it's what is the pricing that's associated with this. And wonderful growth can become too costly, and lousy growth can become very attractive if you can buy it cheaply enough. And the popularity in some ways, the fashionability, can affect those things in the kind of obvious way. I think that applies to just about every asset class except where the actual flow of money that's attracted into it actually expands the pie. And one can argue that certain types of emerging market equities uh, and maybe even debt does that. I, when I set up this list, I could have made it three times longer. Uh, and I felt that gold is a pretty good proxy. If you look back at even timber and other commodities, it's not perfect, but there's a fairly high correlation uh, between gold and some of the others. I would argue I'd rather have gold as my proxy for those things because there's great liquidity. So, and I'd rather have the liquid markets to deal with that. And you know, not only Harvard, but Yale did, I think, a good job in terms of uh, uh, of uh, having a, a timber portfolio, but uh, I would tell you that it's now sell, sell to whom? Uh, and so they've got a little issue as to what, whether they could really capitalize on those things. And those illiquid portfolios, I think what's driving some of these institutions slightly crazy. Number two, how do we make money off climate change? Hmm. <laughs> I, you know, that's a tough one, although I think at some point we will uh, – we will price uh, emissions, and uh, and I think that the uh, the main impact of that will be to cause uh, coal-fired power plants around the world to install uh, carbon capture and sequestration, and uh, that hasn't happened yet. And right now, the companies that are in that business are dying on the vine, mm -hmm. which is absolutely insane. They should be running at full steam producing equ that equipment for the world, but they're not yet, and they will at some point. Yep. Yes, it's 10. Yep. Well, we must. Probably wouldn't have done bad. A, a little full, full disclosure. A little, little full disclosure here. Uh, Bob and I both, coincidentally, uh, maybe not coincidentally, uh, are on the um, investment committee as external advisors to the government of Singapore. <laughs> they would agree with that. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. No, I, I think, look, my, my sense is I don't think you can pick any one country. Uh, and so my, my point of this chart was that I, I would be fairly, uh, fairly optimistic that the bottom 10 countries here are going to dramatically outperform the top 10. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say that because of Singapore's numbers here uh, that, that it's actually uh, the absolute best, uh, and those could certainly change. Thank you. Please. Uh, Marty, would you explain your chart number four, particularly lottery dreams? Chart, chart number four. Okay, chart number four um, relates to a subject which I think is far too little discussed and explored, um, which is the question of risk tolerance. We've touched on it, but um, the vertical line to the right of the vertical line is where you have more money relative to your liabilities, and to the left where you have less relative to your liabilities. And it's very clear cut for pension funds. It's probably reasonably clear cut for individuals approaching retirement, um, uh, for institutions that have spending programs. It also is reasonably clear cut. The sol let's look at the solid line. The, the solid line basically uh, that cuts through that middle, middle line, middle vert vertical line, says that as you have more assets and more of a cushion relative to your needs, one could argue, now by the way, this violates all kinds of economic stuff, Bob. I'm just gonna, you know, this is not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you should theoretically, well, not theoretically, you should practically perhaps take, be, you're in a position to take more risk. Okay, so you're taking more risk as you go up, but you get to a certain point where, you know, enough risk is enough. So that's why that line sort of levels off. And then there are some people and some institutions that say, okay, look, even though we are now 140% or 200% funded 
you know, we're in good shape. Why do you want to take any risk at all? And so they'll actually go and basically um, take all the risks off the table, which may be an analogous to, for an individual, annuitizing their assets. So they have a, uh, ideally with, um, uh, you know, inflation-adjusted annuities, which are hard to come by, ideally with well-priced annuities, which are even harder to come by. But that's one thing they could do. Going in the other direction, you could find yourself getting so close to the bone where you're dipping into and hurting your basic ability to live as you want to live, to fulfill your, your liabilities, that you may say, we can't afford to take risk. And again, with pension funds, this sometimes happens. And they, on the other side of the, other side of the happy continental divide, they basically um, also drop their risk to, um, uh, to stable levels. The question you posed is that how often have we heard um, the following comment? Uh, I've got to get a return of 8% or 9%, and I'll have to at ratchet up my risk in order to get it. Or take a more extreme example, I'm going to have to take some really strong risks in order to get myself to the point where I can afford to live the way I want to live. Okay, and those are lottery, that's what I call lottery dreams. Okay, and I tell you, I've seen it, I've seen it with sophisticated institutions, we've all seen it with individuals. I must tell you, you can make arguments for any kind of risk tolerance pattern, even though we can make fun of them. There is, there is reasonable basis for doing all kinds of things. But I think one thing which is very important is just try to ask yourself, what really is your risk tolerance? What is it really? And why is that important? Because the real risk, I mean, you asked the question about risk and uncertainty. The real risk, the thing that matters most is if the market hurts you and damages you and you find yourself being forced to take actions which basically are contrary to what you would do without being forced in such a fashion. If, I mean, if you found your worst situation to find yourself in a position where you have to sell out assets, even though you think the market is likely to rebound, even though you're sure that over a reasonable span of time it will come back, but you can't afford to take the risk that it won't or even to sit there waiting for it to happen. That's the worst situation. Everything else is sort of, you know, fun and games, okay? But when you find yourself really having to take a behavioral shift, which is one which is either emotionally based or realistically based, and there can be realistic situations uh, where entities have to take risk off the table whether they want to or not, and I've seen them, uh, it is very, very, very painful. Of course, it's more painful if the market then rebounds, but it's painful in any case because you're being forced by that, that drop in your risk tolerance to take an action which essentially robs you of any kind of free investment choice. Thank you for that question. That's one of my hobby horses. Marty, Marty if I could just add, oh, please. first of all, uh, that's what you, you said something about this is totally uneconomic. That's not true. Economists have no way of, uh, they just take risk preferences as given. They don't tell you what they ought to be. And, but I think what you said is absolutely essential and it's probably the most important thing as an investor to prepare for ahead of time that bad situation. And, and what, uh, what I always tell people, we, we used to do this at Goldman Sachs. We, we had a stress test, so we called it, where we asked what happens if the market goes down 50%. And every night we would just make sure that the firm, if the stock market was down 50%, would not be in jeopardy. And I think for individuals, it, it's, it's a similar question. You have to be prepared. If the stock market's down 50%, you don't want to take your chips off the table. In fact, what you want to be doing is you want to be buying equities that day. When everyone else is selling, you want to be buying. And you won't be if you're not prepared, if you haven't thought about it ahead of time. So the question to ask yourself is, how much am I prepared to lose and be willing to take more risk? And it's, it's a very simple question phrased that way. So don't think about, can I take 8% volatility or 10%? You'll never get anywhere that way. If you're prepared to lose, 30% of your wealth, then you can have 60% in equities. And, but, yeah. And, uh, and that's how I would put it. And, and then, you know, just stomach it up when the market is, and there, it happens regularly. The market, it gets overvalued. You want to take money off the table. And, 
and uh, preserve that ability to take risk when the market collapses. And, and if you think about it ahead of time, prepare for it, you're much more able to stomach that emotion of being scared. Because mo- that's why the market is down 50%, because most people are scared. And have liquidity problems. And have liquidity problems. And absolutely, you think about the institutions that got into trouble, and there were a lot of them, they were forced to sell illiquid assets at exactly the worst time. Uh, there's a question here. Let's extend that just a touch. Going back to chart on two, if I then take in potential liquidity problems in my thoughts and therefore have some investments in treasuries or whatever, do I narrow this differential, this one point extra real returns I get, or is that already contemplated in here between the diversified model and the 60? Yes, I think I think your question well, is if you have it, liquidity is a drain on return. Right. Yes. And so if I look at this, do I get even closer between my sixty forty and my diversified, or is there already some uh, liquidity within the diversified model? Ah, good, very very good question. Um, and th- the answer is that one can do a lot. Um, first of all, one should probably have more liquidity in the old fashioned fixed income sense than people had, okay? And maybe facing the kind of risks that uh, Lonnie uh, alluded to, maybe even a little more. Dry powder, doesn't hurt. Uh, um, it does, well, it doesn't hurt, it does hurt, okay? It does draw down your returns. You're, you're right, absolutely right. Over time, even though fixed income has been one of the best performers in the past 20 years, but shouldn't be, okay? <laughs> and, and one should be careful about... Um, just because, I mean, fixed income is a great example. Okay, fixed income from the Volcker days was trading at f- long-term fixed income, 15% for treasuries. Okay, now tra- trading at 330 or something, you know? Uh, that has given phenomenal returns over that period from uh, 1980X on, okay? It's now trading at 330. Think about what that means, okay? It means the game has changed. It's now very expensive. Don't look at the past return as being, I mean, we say this casually, but seriously in the fixed income area in particular. Um, taxes are going to go up, so are interest rates. Maybe not this year, maybe even not next year, but they are sure going to go up. This is not a sustainable level. At least that's my view. It's my firm's view as well. Um, but coming back to your question, because I did remember it, um, there are ways in which you can provide for liquidity in terms of um, your planning, even in a diversified context, without going to fixed income. Yeah, Marty, if I can just underscore Please. something. Mm-hmm. Uh, fixed income is uh, certainly not riskless from a real return perspective. It, it's uh, very uh, risky from an inflation perspective. And uh, I know many uh, investors today are concerned about deflation. and. Um, and, and inflation is uh, something that uh, seems like it's way out in the future. But I think it's inevitable, given the debt that this country has. And uh, so I would think uh, tips, even though they have very low yield, and so I think they're, they're probably uh, uh, not a particularly attractive asset from a yield point of view, but they are much safer, if you want to think about it. And uh, now, it doesn't necessarily address the liquidity issue. I wouldn't think of uh, holding them necessarily for liquidity, but for safety. And liquidity and safety are two different dimensions, really. Uh, public equities are very liquid, but uh, they're very risky. Uh, yeah, and the problem with public equities is a um, liquidity. I think I have that chart in here, um, where liquidity can play in in different ways. I think on page five. Um, you can divide, think of your portfolio in a very, very crude fashion as consisting of high beta and low beta securities assets and high liquidity and low liquidity assets. And you need liquidity, liquidity, unfortunately just one word, but you really need it for different, different purposes. Um, For purposes, uh, if you have a, um, a derivative which you need to put collateral against, if it goes against you, that's one kind of liquidity. If you need money to spend, that's another very concrete form of liquidity. If you need the kind of funds that you want to have in order, the market takes a tumble, a 50% tumble, and you want to buy back to the same level of 
just even a, say you start off 60-40, you want to buy back to 60%, you know how much liquidity you need to do that? 12% of your total portfolio has to be set aside for that purpose. If you are rebalancing on the way down, okay, uh, so you're doing it sort of a continual, how much do you have to set aside to be able to cover that up to the 50% mark? 12% of your portfolio. How many institutions, very sophisticated investors, had set aside 12%, 7%, 5%, any other liquidity for that purpose in their planning? None. None. So you can't, you can use, if you find yourself stressed, and you need to make some kind of payments, you can sell equity because it's liquid for that purpose. If you want to buy back your position, get back to your 60-40, you can't sell equity to supply that. You can't sell equity to buy equity. That is what is called a wash in technical terms. Please. Yes, um, or you could even sell some of that ladder. Yeah. You're going to stomp this wonderful. Wow. <laughs> we're, just, we're just getting going. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to make some observations about emerging market equities. And <laughs> Next time. Next time. Next time. Uh, before we end, let me just say a word about the artwork on the wall here. Some of you may have noticed it. These are uh, Ellsworth Kelly prints, which are on a long-term loan to the Institute from the artist, and um, we're very, very happy to have those. Um, now, uh, let me just say, first of all, to all of you, thank you very much for being here tonight, and then to say to our panelists, that was really terrific, and we're grateful to you for your insights. Thank you. Appreciate us all for the questions. Mark.